Hey, welcome to Socialism for All. This file is being recorded for the March 2023 edition of Socialism for All. And it's an audiobook and discussion of On the Theory of the Socialist Revolution by Maurice Cornforth from 1956. If you like this video, please click like and subscribe and consider supporting on Patreon at patreon.com slash socialism for all. There's a link to Patreon in the video description. So Maurice Cornforth was an English Marxist born in London in 1909, and he's probably best known for his three volume set on dialectical materialism. We plan to read that at some point in the future on the channel. It's kind of long, but we do plan to read it. In the meantime, though, we have this work, which I thought was interesting, and we just posted a Stalin audiobook last weekend, and we're posting another one right after this. So I thought that this would be a good, non-Trotskyist, semi-critical look at Stalin, and also another look at the work of Maurice Cornforth, who, like I said, is primarily known for that work about dialectical materialism, but also wrote on other subjects. So this piece was originally published in the Marxist Quarterly, July 1956, and it was scanned and prepared for the Marxist Internet Archive by Paul Fleurs. Thanks as usual to the Marxists Internet Archive, Marxists.org, for hosting this and thousands of other free Marxist texts. Let's begin. The Socialist Revolution consists of the entire process, on a world scale, through which the socialist mode of production is established, and supplants earlier modes of production. Hence, just as the bourgeois revolution continued through an entire historical period, extending over many years, during which revolutionary changes took place in one country after another, so, it may be expected, will the socialist revolution. So, quick comment, when we talk about modes of production, we're talking like feudalism, capitalism, socialism, in which a new ruling class, not just a new ruling group, but a new ruling class overthrows the previous ruling class and comes to sit atop the structure of class society. What's unique about socialism, as predicted by Marx and Engels, is being that the ruling class in socialism is the proletariat, the propertyless workers that are created in such huge numbers by capitalism. It's the first time that the ruling class is also the majority of the population. Anyway, so Cornforth is saying here, that the socialist revolution is the entire process across the whole world by which socialism replaces capitalism. And again, this happens through revolution. So the most recent example of a new mode of production taking the place of the previous mode of production is capital's overthrow of feudalism. And as Cornforth is saying, that took an entire historical period extending over many years. Revolutionary changes of capital overthrowing feudalism took place in one country after another. And so we can probably expect the same thing with socialism. Continuing the text. I think it is useful to consider the socialist revolution in this way, because then we have to reflect on the characteristics of a long process in time, passing possibly through several different stages of development as it spreads and gathers momentum. If as participants in the socialist movement we can fill our minds with such an historical sense, then we can the better adapt our passions and hopes to reality, and the better understand our current political and economic problems. So comment, of course you want socialism to spread as fast as it possibly can. The reality is, we may be looking at a fairly long period of time, and so when you study the history of socialism, from the idea forming as a revolutionary ideology of the proletariat under early capitalism, and then the first revolution starting to happen, etc. This is something that takes decades and decades, as history already has shown us. So you kind of have to think of it not just in the terms of, you know, the time span happening right in front of you, but that long-term pattern. Continuing. The socialist revolution is the work of generations. There are brilliant successes in its long course, and also disastrous setbacks. Amen. Ideas and methods which carried all before them give rise, as conditions change through their very agency to confusions, dogmas, and falsehoods. Schisms arise, mistakes, and even crimes are committed. Such has ever been the history of revolutions, and the socialist revolution proves no exception. The Principles of Marxism Marxism is the theory of the socialist revolution. And considering revolution as an historical process, we should distinguish the fundamental principles of Marxism, those principles which we may expect to hold good all the time. 
from their consequences in policies and practices, which we may expect to change from time to time, and from ideas and theories which, valid at one stage in one set of circumstances, need to be revised when that stage is past. There are times of transition, and the present appears to be one of them, when it is necessary to review all the ideas and practices inherited from the past in order, in the light of facts and fundamental principles, to reject what is no longer applicable in them, and generally to correct and change them for use in the new conditions. The necessity of this may well make itself known in the form of a crisis within the movement, of the revelation of evils plain for all to see as consequences of the old ideas and practices. I think the revelations of the 20th Congress of the Communist Party of the Soviet Union opened just such a crisis in the movement, and then the tragic and bloody collapse of a socialist government in Hungary came as a further warning that a change is necessary, or we may pay a still dearer price. The revision then comes about as a bitter learning of lessons, a righting of wrongs, a conclusion forced on us by events, rather than as a calm process of scientifically deducing conclusions from premises. What is fundamental and what is permanent in Marxism? What are those ideas we shall not revise, but in the light of which we shall revise other ideas? First of all, the statement of purpose, the goal of socialism. Secondly, the scientific proof of the historical necessity of that purpose. Thirdly, the demonstration of the means to gain it. First, Marxism formulates the goal of the socialist revolution, the abolition of capitalist private property, the abolition of all exploitation of man by man, the social ownership of the means of production and their planned use for the benefit of the whole of society, leading to abundance and the brotherhood of communism. Secondly, Marxism does not put forward this goal as a utopia, as a mere vision of what would ideally satisfy people's needs and make them all happy, but as a goal the practical attainment of which is made necessary by the actual conditions of modern society, and the posing and attainment of which in fact corresponds to objective laws of development operating throughout human history. The development of the social production of the material means of life, in the last analysis, determines the direction of social development as a whole. And if now the goal of socialism is placed as a practical objective, that is because only under a socialist economy can the contradictions of modern capitalist society be solved, and the great modern forces of production be fully utilized. Thirdly, the goal being set and its necessity and attainability proved, Marxism states the indispensable means to attain the goal. In other words, what social forces must be set in motion and what action they must take. Socialism will only be gained by waging the working class struggle. The forces to gain it are the working class in alliance with all the working people. The condition for gaining it is the conquest of power by these forces. And to wage this struggle and achieve the conquest of power, the working class must have its own independent political party. Of course, whole books have been written, and more need to be written, explaining, justifying, and elaborating the principles of Marxism, and the materialist dialectical method which is employed in them, but the above seems to me their essence. As the socialist revolution develops, it is clearly the job of Marxist organizations to conclude from the new facts what is necessary to be done in light of their Marxist principles. And what we have perhaps especially to guard against is fixed ideas about the means for gaining socialism and for building it. That is, fixed ideas about the methods of working class struggle, the nature and policies of a socialist state, and the nature and methods of work of working class parties. In times of transition, we have to criticize and revise not our fundamental principles, but the conclusions we draw from them. This in turn brings with it, and cannot be affected without, changes in sentiments, in moral ideas, in standards and attitudes. Socialism in one country, encirclement and coexistence. The socialist revolution began with the conquest of power and the building of socialism in one country alone, and that not initially a leading industrial country, but a relatively backward one, the USSR. This was not how the founders of Marxism envisaged the beginning of the revolution, and so it presented and continues to present the need for radically new thinking by Marxists. Marx and Engels envisaged the revolution beginning in a group of the most advanced countries of industrial capitalism. Why it in fact began differently has been often explained, and especially clearly, in some of Stalin's writings. But it is perhaps worth noting that in this respect, the socialist revolution has followed what appears to be a universal law of all revolutions, what may be called the law of revolution on the periphery. 
When a given mode of production is ripe for revolutionary change, the change does not begin at the center, but on the periphery. It was not at the center of the slave empire that feudalism first came, nor at the center of feudalism that capitalism first came, nor at the center of world capitalism that socialism first came. Evidently, the old system being well-established at the center makes it more secure there, and the new system emerges first in outlying places where the former system has penetrated and upset still older social relations, but not yet firmly entrenched itself. The opening stage of the socialist revolution was, then, one in which socialism was being founded and built in a single country, and this single socialist power started from a position of backwardness and weakness, encircled by stronger and hostile capitalist powers. It was engaged, therefore, in a desperate struggle for its very life, its survival, and so the whole future of the socialist revolution depended on the socialist power, together with its supporters in other countries, being able to hold off capitalist hostility long enough for the socialist economy to be thoroughly established and rendered impregnable. This was done, though at a heavy cost, the bill for which is still coming in, and so conditions have changed, amounting, as I shall maintain, to the beginning of a new stage of the socialist revolution. The USSR has become a great power, industrially and militarily, well able to hold its own. The boundaries of socialism have been greatly enlarged, first by the inclusion of the people's democracies of Eastern Europe, and second by the inclusion of China, developing rapidly as a great socialist power. The imperialist powers have been greatly weakened, partly by the territorial gains of socialism, partly by the collapse of two of them, Germany and Japan, and partly by the rising tide of revolt in their own colonies, protectorates, and other spheres of influence. In view of these changes, I do not think the old concept of encirclement is any longer adequate. One should rather speak of coexistence. Comment. So at this time in 1956, roughly 40 years after the 1917 Russian Revolution, socialism had gained a lot more territory. It had also successfully fended off fascist assault in World War II. So at this point, while the scales might not have been equal, socialism was not in the same place that it was in, say, you know, the mid-1920s or something, where it was just encircled by capitalism. It had expanded, and again, if not quite equal to capitalism in power, that balance was growing. Its weight as a counterpower in the world was growing. So rather than the one, capitalism just completely encircling and containing the other, well, that containment had failed, and there was now coexistence of two, not equal in size, but two sizable representations of different modes of production in conflict with each other. This was the ongoing class struggle on the global scale. Socialism in Conditions of Encirclement In the conditions of encirclement, ideas and practices arose in the revolutionary socialist movement corresponding to those conditions. It therefore seems vital now to discuss what in them should be corrected and changed when new conditions have come about. Of key importance, I believe, are problems connected with the organization and policies of a socialist state. The Soviet state was developed and had to be developed as, in the first place, an extremely centralized and coercive organ of power. The watchword was that of ruthlessness, Lenin often used this word, in the defense of socialism from internal enemies, in the elimination of the vestiges of capitalism, and in pressing forward the work of socialist construction. And from this, a number of special features arose as characteristic of the first socialist state. The one-party system emerged, all other parties except the Communist Party being banned. A system was evolved of government by decree, with infrequent and short meetings of the elected representatives in the Supreme Soviet. A formidable political police organization was built, with wide powers of arrest and execution. The party and government took on themselves vast powers of ideological direction and censorship, ensuring the virtual suppression of the expression in any form of anti-socialist ideas. Harsh things were done, for example, the elimination after the NEP of the small traders, the deportation of many former kulaks to remote regions, the crushing of nationalist opponents of socialism in various national republics, and so on. All these are very well-known facts, and were approved by revolutionary socialists at the time, and should still be approved retrospectively, as having been necessary in the circumstances. The conditions of encirclement also affected the socialist movement throughout the world. 
the reformists were hostile to the whole Soviet state system, and so they tended to line up with their own capitalists in their anti-Soviet activity. The communists, on the other hand, saw, and in this I believe we were and are absolutely right, the defense of the Soviet Union, this base of world socialism, as a first duty. If the Soviet Union went down, the cause of the working people in every land would suffer a terrible blow. Hence, the communists were staunch and uncompromising in the defense of the Soviet Union, supported its state system and policies, and refused by voicing criticisms or doubts to play into the hands of its enemies. In this period, the communist parties were closely bound together in the communist international, and accepted the binding character of the international's directives. They maintained the strictest centralism and discipline, with a strict orthodoxy of doctrine, and they were intolerant of doubters, deviationists, or factionalists. The Distortion of Socialist Policy It seems to me evident, as I have said, that with changing conditions, the whole heritage of ideas from the encirclement period must be overhauled. But the readjustment which would in any case have been necessary has been rendered peculiarly difficult by the exposure of a whole series of mistakes, abuses, and distortions of socialist theory and practice which began in that period and are now associated with the name of Stalin. This makes the line of advance today dangerous and complicated. It is dangerous because the horror aroused by the abuses makes many people lose their heads and become antagonistic to the Soviet Union and the very principles of Marxism. And it is complicated because the task is not simply to remove the abuses and restore the old established ideas and methods of socialist democracy. It is also to examine the entire heritage of the past period in order by critical discussion to develop the ideas and change the methods for the new period. The distortions of socialist theory and practice which occurred under Stalin are already well known. There was a growth of the power of bureaucracy in all departments of Soviet state activity. Although Stalin had written that it is the workers who rule, absolute power was more and more usurped by Stalin himself. With this grew the so-called cult of the individual, the cult that Stalin was infallible and decided everything, which, as Gomolka recently observed, tended to become not merely the cult of Stalin himself, but of a whole series of his deputies throughout the hierarchy of government. The secret police was made independent of both government and party, and committed senseless outrages. The real danger of hostile acts by enemies of socialism was exaggerated, and any expression of independent opinion began to be regarded as a hostile act, so that enemies of the people were hunted down everywhere, and any communist was in danger of being branded as one. Many minority groups were persecuted. The Stalin dictatorship was not the negation and overthrow of the dictatorship of the proletariat. It was a perversion, and one that can be corrected, leaving the people's power firmer than before. It was not a dictatorship directed against the masses, but was strong and long-lived, because it enjoyed mass support. Stalin did lead the Soviet workers and peasants from conditions of degradation and ruin to being citizens of a powerful socialist state, with socialist industry and agriculture devoted to raising their standards, without exploiters, with a bright future before them and their children. Yet by the time of his death, the perverted dictatorship was already frustrating the further development of socialism. Aspects of Stalin's foreign policy were endangering the peace that is so vital to socialist progress, his home policy was leading to dislocations in agriculture, and stifling the cultural life and democratic initiative of Soviet people. If one reflects on Stalin's work as a whole, it is impossible to ignore the immense contribution he made to leadership in critical moments of the socialist revolution. On the basis of Lenin's previous work, he put forward those ideas on the tasks of building socialism in one country, which enabled it to be built. Lenin had creatively developed Marxist theory to develop with the entire epoch of imperialism and of socialist revolution. Leninism is not restricted to one place or one time, but is the starting point for all subsequent Marxist-Leninist theory and practice. Stalin, in one part of his work, summed up the essentials of Leninism. In another part, he dealt with the problems peculiar to the building of socialism in one country amid capitalist encirclement, and in yet another part, he distorted and played false with socialist theory and practice. Dictatorship and Democracy If we turn now towards the future, I think we must begin with the conception of the dictatorship of the proletariat and the socialist state itself, and with the need to restore the conception of Marx, Engels, and Lenin that the dictatorship of the proletariat means the democratic rule of the overwhelming majority, means that the working people themselves take the running of society into their own hands and control it in their own interests. 
already when the Soviet state was first set up, and it was clear how ruthless the dictatorship would have to be. Lenin emphasized that working class government meant drawing more and more of the working people into the work of government at all levels, and that the more ruthless the government, the more varied must be the forms of control over it from below. The development of the most varied methods of people's participation in government at all levels, of control by the people over every act of government, of the fullest responsibility of government to the people, of such leadership as consults the masses at every turn and helps draw forth their own action, their own initiative, on every issue. This is the essence of a socialist state. This is the very antithesis of the cult of the individual, the power of a bureaucracy, the terrorism of the political police. The question of liberty and democracy is now a crucial one for the future of the socialist revolution, and the reversal of socialist principles by Stalin has given it an acute crisis character. The socialist revolution is the revolution of the working masses in their own interests, to end all exploitation, and to end class-divided society. Hence, the development and completion of this revolution is the same thing as the development of democracy and the completion of liberty. These are tasks set by history, and this fact manifests itself in a mass way, in Britain in particular, by the passionate concern of millions of people, and especially the youth, for democracy and liberty. They value these things and will value nothing that does not proclaim them. They will resist being ordered around, however benevolent the intention. They are revolted by oppression, whoever does it, and in the name of whatever principles it is done. Thanks to Stalinism, the communists have done something to outrage these deep and just sentiments. That, I am sure, far more profoundly than the adverse effects of Cold War propaganda, is one reason why in this country communism is making so little headway amongst those on whom its future must depend, the working youth and the students. But the true aim of socialism is profoundly in accord with the sentiment for democracy and liberty, is indeed the only aim in which the sentiment can find fulfillment. The word socialism is more than the name merely for a new system of economic relationships. So to restrict the meaning would be to kill the idea and aim. Socialism means the ending of exploitation of man by man, a society without class antagonisms, in which the people themselves control their means of life and use them for their own happiness. If the socialist state develops bureaucratically instead of democratically, then the aim is contradicted. These are things we must above all make clear, breaking with and condemning everything which has contradicted our aim, leading the fight for the democratic running of the British state and setting an example of democratic methods ourselves. But are we yet doing this? Democratic Safeguards Repression and Toleration In the present period it becomes evident that overthrow by internal enemies and hostile powers outside is not the only danger by which socialism is threatened. The socialist powers have great internal strength and external support to withstand both internal and external attack. But such attack could still succeed if they become weakened from within and their support outside becomes alienated by a separation of the state from the people. This surely is the danger of which the events in Hungary gave warning. Socialism does, in practice, produce its own dangers to itself, from the insidious tendency for the direction of state to pass into the hands of a group which eludes the popular control. For the very concentration of social ownership into a single directing body does give a basis for bureaucracy to arise. Lenin himself gave warning of this long ago. Therefore, the question of means and safeguards of popular control and of the expression of the popular will is a vital one. A socialist power must always adopt strong and vigilant measures to protect itself against counter-revolution. It must also adopt strong and vigilant safeguards for its own democracy. The question of such safeguards was, even in the days of the bourgeois revolution, uppermost in the minds of the greatest political thinkers. And Marxists might do well to return to and critically study some of their ideas, in order to learn a thing or two from them on how to guide the course of socialist states. Since violations of democracy took place and even assumed extreme forms during the period of encirclement, does not a major danger to the future of socialism now come from socialism itself being frustrated by failing to develop democratically? To decide on correct and just policies, whether in economic, political, or cultural affairs, is always difficult. It becomes next to impossible if the democratic method is not fostered. Parties, states, and leaders are, in their every word and action, being judged by the working people. It is to this judgment that they must always look for correction. If once a leadership takes power to itself, ceases to foster free discussion, fails to criticize itself, and is impatient of criticism from others, 
begins to mistrust the people's judgment and fails to place facts before them, assuming to itself the right to decide how much it is good for them to know, then the bonds of confidence between leadership and people are being severed. Such problems are tied up with those of repression and toleration, for it seems reasonable to assert that the more firmly established socialism becomes, the less are repressive policies required for its defense, the more are policies of broad toleration required for its enlargement. Amid close encirclement, the danger was pressing that, without a strict ideological and cultural censorship, the reactionary forces would take advantage of the least latitude to do serious damage. But with socialism established, another danger emerges, the danger that the stifling of new or unorthodox ideas or modes of cultural expression will begin to stifle socialist ideology and culture themselves. The new flowering of free life, which is the final justification of everything socialists may do, and repel the new forces which should be coming in to reinforce socialist progress. Hence it seems that a new toleration is required, the toleration expressed in the recent Chinese slogan, Let All the Flowers Bloom. Ideas and culture cannot be produced to order. They must achieve their own growth in the minds and hearts of men. Fostered and allowed to grow, they will truly and adequately express the experiences and aspirations of the people, the arguments, conflicts, sentiments, and conclusions of people on the move for a better way of life. If that is assured, then all the greater can be the forces mobilized to defeat the efforts of the people's enemies. These observations have application, I believe, in the socialist countries themselves. Some changes have already taken place there in the new period, and I think that whether smoothly or by overcoming resistance, such changes will continue. I hope, however, that we Marxists in Britain will above all consider their application to our own affairs, to the way in which we run our own party, and the ideas and policies it puts before the labor movement and people. Three Theories That Need Revision The former conditions of encirclement gave rise to three theories in which certain temporary features of the period were magnified into permanent and necessary facts about socialism and its relation with capitalism. At the root of these theories was the idea that while capitalism persisted, the stronger socialism grew, the more menacing would the capitalist attack against it grow. Thus first, as socialism grew stronger, the more would the resistance of the relics of capitalism in the given country increase, and the more menacing would become the efforts of the outside capitalist powers to smuggle in their agents. Therefore, far from dying away, the class struggle would intensify under socialism. Second, the drive of the capitalist powers to destroy socialism by war would also increase, so that in the long run, and unless capitalism was itself destroyed in time, a war became inevitable. Third, in view of the first two considerations, the withering away of the socialist state, predicted by Marx, Engels, and Lenin, could not begin. I think it should be said that these three theories all require revision. When under socialism class antagonisms disappear, there is no longer any basis for class struggle, let alone its intensification. The need for coercive policies to push ahead the building of socialism against opposition therefore diminishes, and an emphasis on coercion becomes not only unnecessary, but actively harmful. More than that, when the initial encirclement has failed, when socialism is already strong in one country, and the capitalist powers are involved in insuperable difficulties, which weaken their entire position. This affects the conditions of class struggle and the way socialism may be built in other countries, which take the socialist road afterwards. The extreme danger to socialism of the resistance of professional, small capitalist, and small farmer strata being reinforced by outside capitalist strength is lessened. Therefore, it is possible to do more to win these strata over and less to repress them, and so gradually to assimilate them into the growing socialist economy. Indeed, such a policy becomes the right one to minimize the danger to socialism from their resistance. That danger now grows if they are treated too harshly, lessens if the patient pressure is exerted to win them over. Such a policy is already in operation in China and is advocated in the British Communist Party's program. Likewise, in the relationship of socialist and capitalist countries, the growing strength of socialism and the growing difficulties besetting imperialism do not encourage but discourage the capitalists attack. They continually probe for possibilities of attack, yet at the same time, and under pressure from the people of their own countries, are compelled to seek ways and means of coming to terms with socialist states. This implies that war is not inevitable. Finally, the essence of the state is its function of coercion, yet the stronger socialism grows, 
the less is the exercise of this function required. The diminution of coercion was just what Marx, Engels, and Lenin meant by the withering away of the state. Stalin, in his well-known argument on the topic, said that the coercive power of the state would be less directed against people within the state's own boundaries, and more against external enemies. Yet if this happens, does that not mean that the withering away has actually begun? Stalin, in fact, under cover of his correction of Marx, Engels, and Lenin, strengthened the coercive power of the state all around, against alleged internal enemies of the people too. Contrary to such a development, a socialist state does need gradually to shed its course of functions, and as Engels put it, gradually to replace the government of persons by the administration of things and the direction of the processes of production. What was undoubtedly true in Stalin's contention was that, so long as capitalism remains, the socialist state must maintain those institutions and powers necessary to resist attack. But does this not mean that the withering away cannot be completed while capitalism remains, not that it shouldn't begin? Is it not a conclusion about the limiting conditions under which the withering away begins, rather than a denial of the process itself? So commenting, that's the end of that section. He's hit on a number of interesting topics here. So remember now, 1956, we're about 10, 11 years after World War II. And, um, you know, that was a positive moment for socialism in that the revolution, the world revolution had expanded, a number of new territories had gone socialist, the uh, you know fascist danger had been defeated for the time being. And I think for the time being is sort of the key phrase there. With the death of Stalin in the 1950s and the rise of Khrushchev and what many would term modern revisionism, we find ourselves in a period of time here where there's a lot of optimism for the expanding socialist revolution. However, what do we know is that 30, 35 years later, most of the thing would collapse and be destroyed politically. And again, that was an economic collapse because, quote, socialism doesn't work. It was a political destruction because capitalism was reintroduced. And why was capitalism reintroduced? Well, a major reason was a lessening of adherence to Marxist principles at basically every level of society. Okay, so that's a few decades out from the time that this is being written. So here I think that you have a call saying that obviously in the early days of encirclement and when socialism has not yet been established, when the revolution has not yet proven itself and is weak in the sense of, you know, weak relative to the well-entrenched capitalism, that it's susceptible and vulnerable to attack and therefore the socialist state is pretty much justified in doing whatever to get itself up and running it, to survive, basically. But by this point, it shouldn't be doing any more than it absolutely has to because the PR is starting to look really bad. This is a time where you need to be drawing more and more people into supporting around the world. And with as few sort of mental gymnastics or justifications, you know, you want relatively unqualified support for hey, look at what this expanding system is doing. It's just better in every respect and that you don't have to you know, justify uh, too many actions by, well, they had to do it because of capitalism. There is going to be some of that, but you don't want any more than is necessary, I think is the argument being made here. And I think that going along with that, you know, the argument that is being made is that, in fact, for some years prior to this having been written, there had been a lot more than was needed or was good for the movement, etc. Now, we know, again, in the end, the USSR was politically defeated. And in China as well, capitalism was restored to a great degree. The Communist Party still runs China. However, it has modified its policies dramatically to include bourgeois elements. And there have been reversals of a lot of the gains that were made in the earlier decades of the revolution. So a question we can ask here from 2023, looking back at 1956, this sort of pivotal moment when fascism was crushed in full retreat, uh, the Nazi crimes were being exposed. Now, eventually, the former fascist powers would be basically rehabilitated under the capitalist part of the Allied powers. But at this point in 1956, there was a vindication of socialism I mean, about as clearly as there had been ever. So this was the clearest shot for expanding the system rapidly and for winning over people around the world 
um, as much as possible. I think that that's the case that Cornforth is making here. And I think that these criticisms are coming from a place of, we have a great opportunity now, let's absolutely maximize this and, you know, again, correct any mistakes that might hold us back during this moment of great opportunity before us. So anyway, in summary here, he identifies three theories. So basically, first, as socialism grew stronger, the more would the resistance of the relics of capitalism in the given country increase, and the more menacing would be the efforts of the outside capitalist powers to smuggle in their agents. And so actually the class struggle would intensify under socialism. Well, what we do know is that the USSR and China were very successful in um, subduing internal enemies you know, in the early decades of their existence. They used a variety of techniques and policies, you know, through different periods of, you know, groups of years here and there to do that. The NEP in the USSR, other policies in China in its early revolutionary history, many of which would happen after 1956, but they were on the way. So you could say that as far as class struggle intensifying under socialism, yes, but only for as long as it would take to actually abolish the classes. That does not seem to be an indefinite process. Second, the drive of the capitalist powers to destroy socialism by war would also increase, so that in the long run, and unless capitalism was itself destroyed in time, a war became inevitable. So in other words, the external danger from the capitalist powers who would be trying to wage war against your system to cripple and destabilize it so that a capitalist counter-revolution could come in and privatize things, re-liberalize, well... I mean, that was a real danger. Here in 1956, they were just a decade out from um, defeating such an effort. And in fact, we would not see and have not seen anything on the scale of World War II since that time. That said, there was the Cold War. There was intense espionage and you know, related efforts by the Western world to try to crush communism. And in fact, they won the Cold War. You know, it's a sad fact, but it is true. Now, I don't know to exactly what extent Cornforth is making the argument that the loss was partly the fault of, say, the Soviet Union for not adopting more flexible policies that would win more hearts and minds, and therefore, you know, there would be such mass um, resistance to the imperialist intrigues that they would basically become completely ineffective, because, of course, in the end they were effective, but we don't know yet because it was only 1956 when he was writing this. So while there wasn't another hot war, there was a very intense cold or silent war going on that whole time. So I don't know, you know, about um, revising that too, too much. Anyway, third, in view of the first two considerations, the withering away of the socialist state could not begin. And, you know, to what extent does that need to be revised, in fact? Um, if we're looking at this as we began reading this passage as a long process, the establishment of socialism through a global process of revolution, then uh, that withering away, you know, may we haven't even seen the second half of the socialist revolution yet. So at what point does the withering away begin? Um, you know, is Cornforth jumping the gun in his analysis? Again, I, I do think he makes a good point that you want to have as much democracy as the system can possibly tolerate. And there is a case that under Stalin, there maybe wasn't uh, the maximal amount of democracy expressed that could have been tolerated. And yes, of course, also the capitalist countries made as much hay as they could possibly make out of the condition of the political police and everything else in the USSR to try to turn Western proletarians against the Soviet system. This became part of, you know, Cold War propaganda and things like that. But, you know, Cornforth is making an argument here that it wasn't just the propaganda. People would see with their own eyes what was happening in the USSR and some of the negative aspects of it or some of the less pleasant aspects of it were just organically off-putting. And hence, you know, people lost some drive to fight for that or there was confusion about how to restructure the fight for a socialism, if not exactly on that model, and so on. Well, we may never know, but let's continue. The Perspectives Under Capitalism The perspectives of socialist revolution in the imperialist countries are themselves profoundly modified by the successful establishment of socialism. 
Yet one aspect of the situation is that, within the perspectives of coexistence, monopoly capitalism appears to be potentially more long-lived than was suggested by doctrinaire theories that it would either break itself in war or be overthrown as a result of its own economic collapse. That imperialism means war is evident every day, but there is no inevitability of such large-scale war as would lead to the violent destruction of imperialism. And if such a war did come, it could lead to the destruction of socialism too. In its internal economy, neither does it seem that there is an inevitability of such economic crisis as would lead to the collapse of the system and compel its replacement. Just because the concentration of capital and the close link-up of monopolies and state make it possible for the monopolies to take their own measures to keep the system working. So comment, um, as far as the monopolies taking measures using the state to ensure that the system keeps working, look at 2008. They broke out a whole toolkit um, that we've never seen them use before to keep their system floating. Um, it involved the enormous pumping in of money, but more than that as well. We're now in 2023, not in the wake of a full scale 2008 type crash, but there were a string of large bank failures uh, a couple of weeks ago. And it, not, not the hugest banks, but significantly sized banks, the biggest uh, bank collapse since 2008. However, they're saying that it may have been contained. It's really too early to say at this point. However, another few 2008-level global economic meltdowns, and we don't know what measures they will take. It seems like they're setting up possibly for a war with China, which seems strange considering that um, various uh, weapons companies and things like that, defense contractors, actually have um, some locations in China opened up. So, you know, to what extent that's dog and pony show, we don't know. The system is not particularly stable, though, at this point in 2023. It does seem to be teetering. Uh, there's been inflation for a long period of time now, several years uh, going on. They tried to blame it on the fact that they paid people to stay home during the pandemic. That's not what's driving it, though. So anyway, it seems that we're on a precipice, but we don't yet know um, what the capitalists are going to do in the wake of the next 2008 level collapse. In other words, what moves they have yet to play? Will they invent new ways to keep their system running, etc.? So we may still see the kind of situation that's described here, um, such an economic crisis as would lead to the collapse of the system and a compelled replacement. Um, now that's still, no matter how weak the system gets, the proletariat still has to push it off of its pedestal in order for us to take its place, but it may become so weak uh, and unstable and lack so much credibility that the average person finally is able to see it for what it is and gets fed up with it and so on. Um, it's possible that just increasingly reactionary governments, political factions arise to keep the system running through crisis by scapegoating various groups. In other words, an intense deepening of fascism and this could basically happen across the entire world. That's the possibility. In other words, that may not have looked that likely in 1956. In 2023, you know, several decades now into deregulated neoliberalism, um, it's looking more and more possible to me where the system may just transform itself into something that uh, it cannot possibly pass off to anyone as just or fair and basically no one will support its existence anymore. Of course, as communists, we need to push consciousness in that direction, raise class consciousness and agitate and make that case for proletarian revolution. Anyway, continuing. What then is happening to monopoly capitalism? Its general crisis is developing through contradictions in which political and economic factors are intertwined. It is losing its colonial possessions, being forced step by step to come to terms with formerly subject peoples while continuing to try, at crippling cost, to put them down and maintain the old relations of colonial exploitation. The more it tries to put them down, the more does it suffer defeat and find itself forced in the end to come to terms. It is being forced step by step to come to terms with the new socialist world while continuing to try to keep the old hostility alive, backed by massive and ruinous armaments. The more it engages in hostile acts, the more cracks appear in its own anti-socialist front. 
It is being forced step by step to make economic and political concessions to the working people at home, while it continues trying to intensify the methods of capitalist exploitation and preserve the privilege of the ruling few. And the more it takes the offensive against the working people, the more strongly do they resist and unite to win concessions. So comment here, this was in the peak of the golden age of social democracy. You know, from about the 1930s through the 1970s, you had this period where capitalism was at its most egalitarian. It was making the most concessions to the working class. The working class obviously never became the ruling class, but it grew in power to a point where, you know, you could buy a house fairly easily. And in the United States, for example, this didn't apply equally across the entire working class. There was great stratification. Uh, there was, you know, a, a labor hierarchy that was racial and, and so on. But in general, the overall um, ease of being a working class person in the United States economically, it was easier uh, than it had been in previous eras. You know, they got rid of the child labor. Um, there was, for many people, a situation where one breadwinner could sort of take care of an entire family of people off of that pay. You know, it was just a different system. But what are we living in now? Well, in the late 70s, they started really scratching away at that. And in the 80s under Reagan, that was the full-on launch of the neoliberal, quote, morning in America. Deregulation, privatization of formerly public things, and then, uh, you know, defunding of whatever wasn't fully privatized. So deregulation, privatization, defunding. So, you know, as far as um, imperialism being forced step by step to make economic and political concessions, that period is now gone. Neoliberalism was a tearing down of all of that. We're several decades in, back into real instability and real um, open hostility and naked aggression by the imperialists. So, continuing. Reaction retains its last cards to play, fascism and war. But so long as the people prevent, as they can prevent, it from taking these last measures, the more do opportunities arise for the labor movement, backed and urged forward by mass working class action, to win increasing support and increasing power in the direction of state affairs, and finally take over altogether. Then its task will be to turn the great monopolies into socialist organizations and bring the central control over economic and political power entirely into the hands of the working people. So commenting again, of course, um, that did not happen. The labor movement was, well, in the United States, it peaked around 1960, and the labor movement was broken, and now it is, you know, a small fraction of what it was previously and is struggling to rebuild itself maybe by a percentage point per year currently in 2023, up from like, you know, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11% uh, of the overall workforce is unionized, down from like 30% at its peak. So we've come a long way downward from 1956. This whole dream of labor just getting stronger and stronger, that has not been linear. We've seen gigantic setbacks that we are possibly just now beginning to fight our way out from. So what's the path forward? Well, are we going to go through the entire 20th century again of building up the labor movement and then getting strong, and then maybe this time it won't be broken and we'll get stronger and stronger and take over? Or will there be something more sudden and catastrophic that happens? I tend to think that it's going to be the latter because we're in a situation of such precariousness, precariousness of capitalism, precariousness of the way that working people are being forced to live today. So the era of sudden, you know, rapid, unpredictable surprise events seems to me more the order of the day than this sort of, you know, gradual building of labor power until we get strong enough to just take over. Um, again, neoliberalism broke the back of all of that. And that was, you know, 45 years ago, roughly, so here we are now in an age of fascism and despair, but also a white hot anger spreading throughout the working class, whether that turns into fascism or into revolutionary proletarian internationalism is going to depend on a number of factors. We don't know yet. Continuing. 
Such perspectives envisage a broad class alliance of the industrial workers with all the white-collar, professional, and even small capitalist sections in home policy and in world relations, a broad alliance of socialists with various forms of national bourgeois states. Such perspectives are not peaceful in the sense that they certainly do include the likelihood of sharp conflicts and the possibility of violent ones. So commenting again, um, you know, that perspective of turning the great monopolies into socialist organizations and the labor movement gets just stronger until it's able to take over and the industrial workers would unite with the white collar professional and petty bourgeoisie. Well, the exact opposite happened. In the United States, for example, you had the Reagan Democrats of the 80s, where um, there was, well, on the Republican side, earlier in the 70s, all the um, racist anti-busing stuff, that was used to peel off um, within even sort of the more blue-collar section of the working class, the uh, white workers, more reactionary white workers, away from an interracial class solidarity, and so that racism was heightened. And in the Reagan years, they had everybody believing that, you know, they were going to be millionaires like the next day. They just had to completely abandon all of their um, class solidarity principles. And it really works. So as far as these white collar professional and petty bourgeoisie, uh, you know, people becoming more socialist minded and allying with the proletariat, literally the exact opposite has happened in the neoliberal era. So anyway... Continuing, certain conclusions emerge for the new period. The Soviet path, the path followed by the Russian Revolution, is not the only path to socialism. On the contrary, having been followed once, it need not be followed again. Well, now that it's been dismantled, I don't know, maybe it does, but according to the different conditions in different capitalist or colonial and formerly colonial countries, the different peoples must map out their own independent roads, converging on the common goal. In doing so, they are called on to maintain the constant international solidarity between different socialist movements, and between socialist movements everywhere and the countries where socialism is already established, on the basis of equality, exchange of ideas and criticisms, and independence of judgment and policies. They will adopt their own programs, their own conceptions of the working principles of a socialist state in their own countries, and put them into practice. If Britain advances to socialism, will it not be the mass British labor movement that will lead the way, make the decisions, take power, and use it well or badly? And this will never be done without Marxist leadership. The test for the British Communist Party, as the vehicle of Marxism in Britain, will be whether it is able to so adapt its ideas, policies, and organization to the real conditions of struggle as to win its place in the leadership of British labor. Comment. So in other words, communists can study all the Marxism that they want. However, if we don't actually forge the relationships with the masses, they're not going to listen to us and they will not heed any of our advice or leadership. Continuing. Socialism is not inevitable. What has been termed its inevitability consists in this, that only through socialism can human progress continue. But there is not and cannot be any absolute deterministic inevitability in human affairs, since humans make our own history and we choose what to do. What is determined is not our choice, but the conditions under which it is made, and the consequences when it is made. The meaning of scientific socialism is not that it tells us that socialism will come regardless, but that it explains to us where we stand, what course lies open to us, what is the road to life. And so that's the end of the text. I like that, th that clarification of socialism not being inevitable. What is meant by socialism is inevitable is that it's the only way we can possibly have a future. So <laughs> to the extent that there is going to be a future for you know, the human species, then socialism must happen, therefore is inevitable in that sense. But, you know, can capitalism culminate in an extinction event for human society? It's also a possibility. So it's not inevitable that proletarians win this struggle. It's just that if capitalism wins, we all lose, including the capitalists. So anyway, I have one other note I'd like to add before we close out. So in the section where I was talking about, you know, this possible alliance between the industrial workers and the white collar workers and petty bourgeoisie, uh, clearly that didn't happen. In fact, the uh, white collar workers, professional managerial people 
and the uh, petty bourgeois elements were definitely led into more of a class collaborationist, you know, aspiring millionaire kind of consciousness. But there was another part to that. In world relations, a broad alliance of socialist with various forms of national bourgeois states. So what is going on in China? Um, again, there has been a great degree of capitalist restoration. Towards what ultimate end, we do not know. So the people who are cheering on the sort of multipolarity today that I'm deeply, deeply skeptical of, as I have stated many, many times, um, what you're probably going to get there is just some sort of either warring uh, capitalist states or, um, you know, the most peaceful scenario is that they come to some sort of, um, you know, uh, cooperative solution or, or a diplomatic solution uh, between themselves and they avoid war, but the exploitation of the uh, working class globally continues apace. So the need for a socialist uh, revolution continues almost sort of a redo of um, where we were in the first place. But there is this idea that, um, you know, what vestiges of actually existing socialism are still in the world today in 2023. And some communists do not recognize any states as being actually existing socialism. Others um, who might be criticized as more opportunist consider that, you know, there may be uh, fairly large actually existing socialist states, though most of them hopefully would also uh, at least concede that there's a great degree of uh, setback and contradiction within them. That there is this sort of um, ongoing alliance between, for example, China and, uh, you know, other states outside of the imperial core to do some sort of progressive thing for humanity. Myself, I think that that's an extraordinarily limited vision, and I'm very skeptical of what's going to come of that. Again, most of these people rarely have ever talk about class struggle. That is de-emphasized to a great degree. It reeks of opportunism, most of the time when I hear people um, pitching this. And I just don't think that we have the sort of rosy optimistic situation that we would have had even in the 70s. In other words, rather than waiting around for these things to happen, the proletariat would do better to sharpen its pitchfork, so to speak, and not rely on these, you know, sort of, quote, populist states uh, to do anything on their behalf. Take the example of the Russian Revolution, and let's do this thing ourselves, we can. History shows us that. So let's not wait around.